Um, this lecture today is titled, If We Build It, They Will Come, Industrial Folly and the Fate of Northwest British Columbia. Uh, my name is Ashley Aikens. I'm a Lou Scholar here at the Institute, and I'm honored to be one of Wayne Davis's PhD students. Uh, before going any further, I would like to respect the traditions of the Coast Salish First Nations, and in particular, I wish to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Musqueam peoples, who have called this area home for many thousands of years and continue to do so today. Now, though we probably don't need to introduce our speaker, I'd like to give a few highlights uh, to do so. So Wade Davis is a professor of anthropology and the BC leadership chair in cultures and ecosystems at risk at the University of British Columbia. Between 1999 and 2013, he served as explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society and is currently a member of the National Geographic Society Explorers Council, an honorary vice president of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. He's author of 20 books, including One River, The Wayfinders, and Into the Silence. He holds degrees in anthropology and biology and received his PhD in ethno ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. His many film credits include Light at the Edge of the World, an eight-hour documentary series written and produced for the National Geographic Society. Wade Davis is the recipient of 11 honorary degrees and various awards. In 2016, he was made a member of the Order of Canada. It's my honor to welcome Dr. Wade Davis. Well, it's such a surprise to run to Ashley. She, you know, you'd think she had been told to do that weeks ago. She was told to do that about three seconds ago. <laughs> uh, I just was fortunate to be with her. She's an incredible woman. Um, in Peru, where she's been working for almost 15 years with uh, her own NGO dedicated to um, supporting the revitalization and maintenance of traditional textile arts in the Cusco area. And it was really a joy to see her almost like a pipe piper with the community members of all dozens of um, indigenous uh, communities. Um, so, so affectionate for what she was doing. So it's really great to have her with us today, and welcome back to Vancouver. You know, I, I don't normally speak about British Columbia, and I, I, I suppose I, a lot of people don't even understand, know that I have very deep roots here. I mean, my grandfather was a doctor in a mining town in um, Kimberley, in the Rockies. I, I grew up working in the bush in British Columbia. And with the recent controversy over Site C, I, I thought it might be interesting to try to put together a talk that address some of these issues that are unfolded in the Canadian North, um, but through the lens of anthropology and with a certain global perspective. Now, as I, as I mentioned, my, my father came of age in the 1930s, uh, the son of a doctor in this Kaminko mining town of Kimberley in the Kootenays, and to reach his boarding school in Vancouver Island at that time, he had to take a, a ferry down the river to Spokane, Washington, where he could catch a train back to the coast and up to Vancouver Island, and such was the state of infrastructure in the province at the time, and it was kind of an economically debilitating void that men of my father's generation sought avidly to fill when they came back from the war in 1945. And, of course, those of us who are old enough to remember will recall that the master architect was the legendary W.A.C. or Wacky Bennett, Premier from 1952 to 1972, who was another well-intentioned son of a small interior town whose vision for the province embraced public works projects on a gargantuan scale, viewing each as almost a biblical challenge, a, a triumph of his, of his own personal will. For those of you who are not from British Columbia and have or recent arrivals, either as students or as faculty, it's hard to imagine the the weight he had over the fate of the province during his 20 years leading the government. And as his political rival and later ally, flying Phil Gallardi, laced the province with bridges and roads, many through lands conveniently owned by his own sons, Bennett stamped his name on the largest construction project 
in the history of the province, one of the world's largest earth-filled dams, built at a cost of $6 billion in today's currency that flooded 350,000 acres of forested land, displacing with no consultation whatsoever the entire Sekedene First Nation, a people who, as many of you know, have yet to fully recover from the blow. Now, Lackey Bennett, like most of his peers, believed that any natural resource not used was wasted. Modern industrial logging, for example, took off during his tenure, driven in part by new machinery and technologies, but fundamentally fueled by a triumphant ideology that called literally for the elimination of all primary force in the province. Science, it was said, had shown that the annual increment of cellulose in a young tree plantation was greater than that in an ancient forest. The old growth was, therefore, by definition, decadent, a forest in decline. The trees were overmature. To see evidence of decadence, you simply had to look at the deadfall, tons of rotting timber wasted on the forest floor. The goal of proper forest management was to replace these inefficient stands with fresh and productive new forests. A regime of carefully monitored, clear-cut logging would eliminate the old growth, the debris would be burned, the land sown with uniform plantations <coughs> comprised of only the most up-to-date conifer seedlings. In short, scientific forestry would clean up the mess inherited from nature. Now, if it served the economic interests of industry by rationalizing the wholesale, total eradication of the old growth forest of the province, so much the better. Now, men like my father shared Wacky Bennett's frontier values, honed by the Great Depression, forged years before the words ecology, let alone biodiversity, sustainability, biosphere, or climate change had entered our vocabulary. If you recall, in the early 1960s, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was considered a great environmental victory. Now, critically, to look back at that era is not to judge, but merely to suggest that we live in a completely different time, and that to allow such values of the past to determine public policy today would be as inappropriate as anchoring our future in the conviction of 19th century clergymen who claimed with absolute certainty that the earth was but 6,000 years old. And yet, as a recent decision on the highly controversial Site C Dam suggests, this is precisely what we've done and continue to do throughout the northern reaches of our province. That the federal government and provincial governments have squandered hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on unrealized mega development projects often comes as a surprise to urban Canadians, for much as we like the idea of the North, few of us ever go there. When I met with Gordon Campbell on the very day that he left office, even as he was packing up his memorabilia in his office here in Vancouver, I was astonished to learn that in his two terms of, in office, and indeed in his entire life, he had never visited a quarter of the province, the Northwest Quadrant, even as his government funded capital-intensive initiatives that promised to fundamentally transform the region. Now, to appreciate the extent of these ambitions, not to mention the fiscal and environmental consequences of implementation and failure, I'd like to consider with you today just five industrial projects, all of which I've known very well in my lifetime, um, uh, all transformative in scale that have been proposed or enacted in Northwest BC since the late 1960s. Now, nearly all of these have centered in the Stikine Valley traditional <coughs> territory of the Taltan First Nation, a vast and remote region the size of Switzerland. It's the kind of place that we as Canadians could throw England and the English would never find it. Now, the first of these projects <coughs> And the only one to come online and reach the end of its life was Cassiar Asbestos, which declared bankruptcy just before shutting down in 1992. But for 40 years before that closure, the mine had thrived as one industrial magnet for infrastructure development and employment in a region the size of Oregon. 
company town of 1,200, Cassiar attracted workers by offering easy access to home ownership and supporting an active civic culture along with the facilities of a regular town. They had a movie theater, two churches, two schools, a small hospital, a ski hill, a curling rink, a library, a rec center. The Lions Club and the PTA met regularly in the company hall where also gathered members of the handicraft, the bridge, the badminton, and the gun clubs. There were hockey teams and choirs, boy scouts, and girl guides, but when the mine closed, every single structure was dismantled and evacuated. Those who had made a home there, in some cases for multiple generations, simply scattered to the wind. And today, the site of Cassiar is just a ghost town of fading memories. All that remains is a mountain of toxic asbestos tailings, 16 million tons altogether. Now, the 1970s, when I first worked in the Stikine, and my first job was a park ranger in the newly created Spazizi Wilderness. It was sort of a dream academic job uh, invented by the NDP government at the time. My job description as the first park ranger when it just been created, there was a biggest wilderness roadless park, was wilderness assessment and public relations. And in two four-month seasons, I saw 12 people, so there was no one to relate publicly to. <laughs> but I fell in love with the country, and I've written a great deal about it. And since 1987, I've owned a fishing lodge in the Stikine, uh, the closest private holding, in fact, to the Spatsizi wilderness. Well, 1970s brought two mega-projects to the Stikine, both of which, in the memorable words of the northern filmmaker Monty Bassett, ultimately collapsed under the weight of their own stupidity. In 1969, BC Rail decided to extend the provincial railroad grid some 540 kilometers from Fort St. James northwest to Dees Lake, an arbitrary destination that at the time had but a handful of broken down structures once owned by the Hudson Bay Company. The rationale was to open up the country for resource extraction, the most particularly the extensive anthracite deposits underlying the headwaters of the Skeena, the Stikine, and the Nass, a region now known to the Taltan as the sacred headwaters. Now, construction of the Dees Lake extension began in 1970, but cost soon soared to $1.5 in today's dollar, five times the original estimate. And when in 1977, amidst considerable controversy, the project was abandoned, the rail grade reached all the way to Dees Lake, but only the first 80 kilometers at the southern end were operational. A royal commission established to review the project revealed not only massive cost overruns, but also shoddy construction from one end of the line to the other, a consequence in part of Wacky Bennett's imposed mandate to build the project at, quote, minimum cost, maximum speed. Today, the grade locally dubbed the railroad to nowhere serves as the most expensive backcountry mountain bike trail in the world. <laughs> now, even as the provincial government struggled with the political fallout of the collapse of the Dees Lake extension, BC Hydro was gearing up to build a massive hydroelectric development in the canyons of the Iskut and Stikine River. Three dams were planned for the Iskut and two on the Stikine, including Site Z, a concrete arch dam projected to soar as high as a 75-story building. Now, together, the sticking dams were expected to completely inundate Canada's largest and most dramatic canyon, destroying an endemic population of mountain goat, but also a stretch of wild river today known throughout the world as the K2 of whitewater challenges. To put that in perspective, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado sees 27,000 people rafted every year. No raft has ever made it through Canada's greatest canyon. In all of history, less than 100 world-class kayakers have managed to make it through. Now, the cost of the project was a staggering $46 billion, again in today's currency, making it the biggest capital project ever conceived by BC Hydro. Now, by very project design, the Site Z Reservoir, 
would reach up to Stikine and drown the new railway bridge that had only just been completed at considerable expense as part of the BC Rail Dees Lake extension, which was an indication of just how little coordination occurred between government entities responsible for these enormous industrial projects. <coughs> now, despite BC Hydro's dire predictions at the time that without the Stikinistic dams, the province would face a severe shortages of electricity, the project happily stalled, but not before tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars had been spent. What saved the canyon was both strong opposition from the Taltan First Nation and a fortuitous shift in the corporate culture of BC Hydro that, as you'll remember, resulted in a new public focus on efficiency and conservation. And of course, the power shortages long anticipated by proponents of the dam never materialized. Now, my final two examples, Christy Clark's faded dream of an LNG-driven economy and the saga of the Northwest Transmission Line, her power line to nowhere, leave little doubt that industrial folly conflated with corruption persists to this day. Indeed, the more you know about what's going on in the North, the more one is left to wonder what, if anything, has been learned from the costly, costly debacles of the 1970s, even as we continue to elect politicians cut from the same ethical cloth as flying Phil Gallardi. Whatever one's views on the virtues or challenges of the energy sector of the economy, the provincial government's failure after such fanfare to bring online even a single LNG development must surely leave any British Columbian both discouraged and, frankly, embarrassed. Now, for more than a decade, I served on the International Advisory Board for Peru LNG, a US $3.8 billion project led by Hunt Oil, the world's largest privately held energy company. Investing tens and tens of millions of dollars in environmental mitigation that was not required by Peruvian law, our consortium built an exemplary 400 kilometer pipeline across the Andes and at the coastal terminus of Pampa Melchorita, an equally impressive port an LNG facility capable of processing 620 million cubic feet of gas every day. Now, as a consultant on that project with oversight responsibilities ultimately reporting to the multilateral banks that funded the project, I was from the start privy to internal discussions and experienced what it actually means to bring such a project on stream, both the costs, the scale of the enterprise, the challenge of international markets. Ours was the first LNG plant ever constructed in South America, and the race to get it built was informed by a sense that we had, that Hunt had, that given international market demands, there might not be room for more than one or two, possibly three, such export facilities along the Pacific coast of the entire Western Hemisphere. And so when I later learned that Christy Clark's liberal provincial government claimed to be considering no fewer than 20 proposals, all calling for separate export facilities, even while predicting and promising $1 trillion in revenue and promising to add 100,000 permanent jobs to the provincial economy, I could only conclude that those at the helm of our provincial government were either being dishonest or had only the vaguest idea of what they were talking about. One dreaded the former and feared the latter. Well, finally, we come to perhaps the most disturbing of all of these mega projects, the one that on the face of it ought to have been the least controversial, the extension of the provincial power grid through the construction of the 344-kilometer, 287-kilovolt Northwest Transmission Line from Terrace to Bob Quinn Lake. In 2008, the Mining Association of British Columbia released an in industry survey estimating that $15 billion in new capital investment <coughs> leading to 10,000 full-time jobs might be generated if only power on an industrial scale could be delivered to the mineral-rich northwest quadrant of the province. Gordon Campbell, while still in office, immediately set aside $10 million 
to kickstart the environmental assessment. Now, rationalizing the cost of the investment, initially budgeted at $400 million, were a series of large industrial projects in different stages of development, all promising and all in Taltan territory. These included Imperial Metals open pit copper and gold proposal on Toggan Mountain, two similar mines at Ballor Creek and Shaft Creek, a run of the river hydro project at Forest Kerr Canyon, and Shell's million acre coal bed methane tenure in the Klippan, and Fortune Minerals anthracite claim also in the Klippan. Now, even as the Premier launched the initiative, Bing Jiro, then Vice President of the Mining Association of BC, cautioned that, quote, all these big ticket items were more of a wish list than anything certain. And he added that, quote, nobody should necessarily go to the bank on this. <laughs> well, unfortunately, somebody did. You, the British Columbia taxpayer, although well, you didn't know it at the time. Within two years, the cost of the Northwest Transmission Line had increased almost doubling. Eventually, it would come in at $736 million. In addition, BC Hydro committed you to reimburse Imperial Metals $52 million for the cost of building their dedicated line from Wapkin, which, remember, was simply a highway yard, to the Red Chris mine site on Tottenham Mountain, as well as the cost of an additional line further north to the Taltan community of Iskit. Now, the reason this additional line to Iskit was necessary is because the Harper government had invested $130 million, again of your money, from the Green Infrastructure Fund set aside by federal parliament to transition our economy to a greener way of living. And the official rationale for the inclusion of $130 million in the building of this extension of the grid into the Northwest BC was that it was going to get 320 Taltan people in the small community of Iskid off diesel generation and lower their carbon footprint, albeit at a per capita cost of $400,000. As it turned out, in the building of the power line right of way, the government would burn the equivalent of 14,000 log trucks of wood rather than seeking an export market. And of course, why possibly attempt to insulate the Stuart Cassier Highway built again at tremendous cost as a scenic route to Alaska, why possibly insulate it from the mining project when you can build it more cheaply simply by cutting down the forest to the edge of the road. Now, for the provincial government, things began to unravel just as construction on the Northwest Transmission Line was coming to an end. You'll recall that because of pressure from the Taltan, in 2012, Shell, to their immense corporate credit, withdrew from its coal bed methane development in the Klippan. The promising and highly promoted Galore Creek Copper and Gold project imploded due to fiscal challenges and uncertainties. Fortune Minerals, rebranded as Arcos, remained committed to its anthracite play in the sacred headwaters, but given Taltan opposition, and especially in the wake of the Supreme Court decision in the uh, Chilcotin, that project had extremely weak legs. Now, Alta Gas's hydro project at Forest Kerr was a going concern, but the public was going to be hard-pressed to understand why nearly $800 million of taxpayers' money had been spent to extend the provincial grid merely to facilitate the ability of a small run-of-the-river hydro project to sell power back to the state. And so by 2012, of the five other industrial projects that initially rationalized this massive public expenditure, only one remained viable, and that was Imperial Metals' play on Tottingham Mountain, its proposal to build a massive open pit copper and gold mine. Now, let me back off for a second and, and make it clear that there is most assuredly nothing wrong with governments creating infrastructure that will promote economic growth and bring benefits to a wide range of citizens and diverse business interests. That's what governments are expected to do. But things get a bit murkier, what murkier, 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 <laughs> sorry, 
where the benefits accrue exclusively to one sector of the economy, and they become downright muddy when they effectively benefit a single company, especially one owned by an individual who had just heavily bankrolled the political campaign of the very government authorizing the massive public expenditure. And here was another challenge for Christie Clark's government. Imperial Metals' Red Press project had only been kept afloat by the personal investment and loan guarantees of Murray Edwards, owner of the Calgary Flames. Now, I know Murray well. We served together on the board of the Banff Center. He's a patriotic and a decent Canadian. He happens to be deeply invested in the energy sector of our economy, but he's a great philanthropist. Uh, but the point, the point is that it was his personal investment through his companies of at least $200 million, in the end much more than that, that had literally, whether he liked it or not, bought him effective ownership of Imperial Metals. And yet on the eve of the 2013 provincial election, with the Liberals behind in the polls, Murray hosted a petroleum club in, in Calgary, a private dinner for Christy Clark that raised a million dollars for her campaign. That led to the media buy that allowed the Liberal Party to reverse the polls and led, helped lead to their re-election. Now, nothing illegal in this, I stress, but it was hardly something to reassure British Columbians, given that Red Chris was the only industrial project, aside from Forrest Kerr, to benefit from the construction of the Northwest Transmission Line. Yet even here, the optics of the government were problematic. Cottigan is no ordinary mountain. It is home to the largest population and concentration of stone sheep in the world, a resident population that attracts extraordinary numbers of predators. And I know this because I live at the base of the mountain. A wildlife sanctuary in the sky, the massif looks west to its Zaita, sacred mountain of the Taltan. <laughs> and east to the headwaters of the Stikin, the Skin, and the Nass, the sacred headwaters as the tall town described, and beyond Spatsisi, commonly recognized as the Serengeti of Canada. There are over 4,000 copper and gold projects in the world. To build an open pit mine on the summit of Tottingham was in the eyes of critics of the project comparable to drilling for oil in the Sistine Chapel. But there was another dilemma, because at the foot of Tottingham are found a string of headwater lakes of the Iskit range, each one more beautiful than the next. Yalui, where we have our lodge. Uh, Kinistan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Elantanajan, Kinistan, and of course right here, Kluya and Tottingham, the very valley valley threatened by the tailings impoundment of the Red Chris mine. But consider the government's dilemma. They had spent over $800 million on what was essentially a subsidized mine, line for a single mine. At the same time, the provincial government had to have a successful mine somewhere, otherwise they would have been accused of building a power line to nowhere. And when the power, when the railroad to nowhere was collapsed in the early 1970s, it brought down the provincial government. Now, if the optics of Red Chris on Tottenham were already poor, they became truly dreadful, public perception that is, in the wake of the Mount Pauly disaster in August of 2014, a catastrophic failure of the Tailings Dam at Imperial's other major holding an open pit copper and gold mine near Quinell Lake that had been promoted by the company as the exact design protocol for the Red Chris development on Tottigan Mountain. Altogether, 10 million cubic meters of industrial water, toxic water, and 4.5 million cubic meters of slurry tainted with heavy metals surged into one of the most celebrated salmon lakes in the world, the place of origins of fully a quarter of the Fraser River run. As it turned out, Imperial Metals had a history of operating the tailings pond beyond capacity since at least 2011. The independent investigation into the cause of the breach concluded that while the dam had failed because of an undetected weakness in the foundation, it could readily have failed also by overtopping, which it almost had done in May of 2014 
two months before the disaster. Or it could have failed, the report continued, by internal erosion, for which there was some evidence. Clearly, the independent panel concluded, multiple failure modes were in progress, and they differed, this is a quote, mainly in how far they had progressed down their respective <coughs> failure pathways. Now, the Mount Pauli disaster sent shockwaves through the tall tank community at Iskit. They heard media reports that employees at Mount Pauli had quit high-paying jobs because management refused to listen to their concerns about the safety and integrity of the dam. They discovered that independent consultants hired by Imperial had expressed similar concerns only to be ignored. They learned too that the insurance policies held by the company were insufficient to cover the cost of cleaning up the mess. The insurance bond held by Imperial was a mere $15 million dollars when the cost of cleaning up the two most recently comparable spills, one in Spain and one in Tennessee, had been 350 million and 600 million, respectively. And in the wake of Mount Pauli, there was a strong feeling in the north and in Iskit, indeed throughout BC, that the Red Chris mine would at least be put on hold until the cause of the Mount Pauli debacle was fully determined and corrective measures established and implemented. In fact, Quite the opposite occurred. Just six months after the disaster, and within days of the release of the report that was by every measure damning, and even as search warrants were issued allowing government inspectors to comb the imperial files at Mount Pauli, the Red Chris mine received an interim permit to begin processing copper and gold using exactly the same wet tailings design that had failed at Mount Pauli. Meanwhile, with the Kafkaesque logic that Imperial required a revenue stream to cover the cost of its cleanup, the provincial government allowed Imperial to return to limited production at Mount Pauli less than a year after the disaster, even as it fast-tracked the permitting process for the Red Chris mine. And so, in June of 2016, Mount Pauli returned to normal operations, processing 20,000 tons of rock a day. To date, Imperial has not been obliged to pay any fines, nor have any of the small family businesses compromised by the disaster on Quinnell Lake received a penny of compensation from e either government or industry. Meanwhile, back on Tottigan, after two years in operation, the eastern plateau of Tottigan and the entire upper Tottigan River drainage has been transformed into an industrial um, zone. Yet the fate of the Red Chris mine remains uncertain. In December of 2017, only last month, a leading credit rating service, Moody's Investor Service, assessed Imperial Metals, quote, probability of default, and concluded, concluded that the company was, quote, judged to be speculative, of poor standing, subject to high default risk, and may be, in fact, in fault on some, if not all, of their long-term debt obligations. According to the latest report of the BC Chief Minister of Mines, Imperial Metal has but $73 million set aside in bonds against estimated reclamation costs of at least $100 million. And so should Imperial fail, you will be the ones who pay for its default, and you will be the ones, and your children will be the ones obliged to pay for whatever cleanup can be done. So in the end, we are surely left, I think, overwhelmed by the scale of the corruption, the extent of the folly, and the aggregate waste of taxpayers' wealth. And yet, incredibly, it all continues. Consider for a moment the ill-fated site sea dam in the East River. Conceived by the local government of Christy Clark, this pharaonic, harshly built project had already cost over $2 billion when inherited by the NDP after their election in May of 2017. So presented, politically, it presented a true challenge of leadership. The Premier had to decide whether to spend $2 billion to clean up a $2 billion mess inherited from the previous government, or to go ahead with the project, mortgaging the province's future for a white elephant that few wanted, and according to many technical reports, nobody needed. By late 2017, as you all know, with the decision pending, the Premier came under increasing pressure from union supporters 
keen to discredit the conclusions of the BC Utilities <laughs> Commission, independent findings that had fundamentally questioned the need and challenged the cost effectiveness of the project. Union representatives, of course, spoke of energy requirements and projections, but clearly their primary concern were the anticipated construction jobs that would come about should the ill-fated mega project proceed. The very rationale, incidentally, that had in good measure propelled the proposal from its inception. And again, as you know, in the end, the Premier succumbed to pressure from the unions <coughs> and took the politically expedient decision to proceed despite anticipated further costs of over $10 billion, all for a project that on the campaign trail only months before he and his colleagues in his government had vociferously rejected for sound economic, technical, and environmental reasons. And of course, if many British Columbians were disappointed by the decision, many more who hadn't really paid attention were stunned to realize the Liberal government of Christy Clark had committed them to such industrial folly in the first place. But silenced in the shuffle were any number of authorities, native and non-native alike, engineers, technicians, hunters and trappers, economists, farmers, ranchers, guides, environmentalists, lawyers, and owners of small businesses who had argued persuasively that the dam was both unnecessary and certain over time to be a serious drain on the well-being of the provincial's economic base. But again, once again, the voices that prevailed were those same voices reflecting the same values and self-serving agendas that have brought us over the last 50 years every one of the industrial fiascos that litter the landscape of the North. For too many years in British Columbia, politicians in both parties have told us that the only way we can generate an economy is to tear open our land, tear down our forests, and empty our seas. Such tired and threadbare thinking both denies our potential and betrays our destiny. If you think about it, we are so few, and we live in a place that is so vast and so bountiful. We are civil, decent, and amongst the most educated citizenries in the world. Our intellectual and entrepreneurial capacity is limitless. And so the next time a politician suggests that the only way we can make a living is to compromise our natural heritage, please remind him that this is not an issue of a lack of economic options, but rather a dearth of imagination and moral character on the part of those we elect to office. But political leaders thinking not of the next election, but of the next generations, know that true and lasting prosperity in British Columbia will only come about as we transform our economy from one dependent on natural resource extraction to one based on knowledge, technology, and innovation. And of course, market forces are already driving us in the right direction. Information technology and biotech, together with media and film, are now the dominant elements in the economy of the Lower Mainland, home to the majority of British Columbians. Tourism throughout the province employs more workers than mining, uh, industrial forestry, and commercial fishing combined. A government can play a significant role with wise and cost-effective investments in education, infrastructure, affordable housing, and virtually anything that will enhance the quality of life making our province ever more desirable for individuals and businesses aspiring to occupy the heights of the new knowledge-based international economy. But what we don't need are governments and politicians beholden to individuals and enterprises entrenched in the past and blind to the world coming at them from tomorrow. With the extension of that Northwest transmission line, the Liberal government spent $800 million of public funds on a power line that has largely benefited a single mine employing but 300 people, less than that, an industrial project that by design implied the violation of perhaps the richest wildlife sanctuary in Canada. That very same level of investment would have allowed Vancouver to extend the SkyTrain from Burnaby to Point Grey, enhancing the well-being of millions of British Columbians and the prosperity of hundreds of independent and self-sufficient uh, uh, businesses, not one of which would even imagine seeking or receiving government subsidies comparable to Christy Clark's singular gift to Imperial Medals. 
And this history of fantasy and folly, avarice and corruption, diminishes us all, even as it shadows our quest for a truly sustainable economy, the heart of which will be new sources of power. But the move toward a clean energy future is not simply about shifting away from carbon. Were that to be the case, we would endorse every hydroelectric project, not to mention every nuclear reactor we could possibly build. Clean energy is but a metaphor for a process of societal and economic transformation, historic in scale and significance, and profoundly hopeful in its promise. Now let me just step back uh, and put on the anthropological lens for a moment to try to put all of this in, in a broader perspective. It's useful, for example, to remember that climate change, for example, while it's become humanity's problem, it was not caused by humanity. It came about because of the consequences of a very particular worldview. For three centuries, we've consumed the ancient sunlight of the planet. Our economic models in the West are projections and arrows when they should be circles. To define perpetual growth on a finite planet as a sole measure of economic well-being is to engage in a form of slow collective suicide. To deny or exclude from the calculus of governance and economy the cost of violating the biological life support systems of the planet is the logic of delusion. Now when we celebrate modernity, or at least what we celebrate as modernity, if you really think of it, again through the anthropological lens, it's simply a constellation of beliefs and convictions and economic paradigms that represent but one way of doing things, of going about the complex process of organizing human activities. Our achievements have been stunning and our technical, technical innovations dazzling. But critically, these accomplishments do not make the Western paradigm exceptional or suggest in any way that it has or ought to have a monopoly on the path to the future. Now, all cultures are myopic, faithful to their own interpretation of reality. And our way of thinking about the natural world in particular is but a product of our past, rooted in our culture and history. Recall that during the Renaissance and well into the Enlightenment, in our quest for personal freedom, we in the European tradition liberated the individual from the collective, which was in some sense the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. But also in doing so, we abandoned <coughs> many of our intuitions for myth, magic, mysticism, and most importantly, metaphor. The universe, declared René Descartes, was composed only of mind and mechanism. With a single phrase, all sentient creatures, aside from human beings, were devitalized, as was the Earth itself. Science and time, as Saul Bella wrote, made a house cleaning of belief. Phenomena that could not be positively measured could not exist. The triumph of secular materialism became the conceit of modernity. And the idea that land could have anima, that the flight of a hawk could have meaning, that beliefs of the spirit could have true resonance, was literally ridiculed, dismissed as ridiculous. And the reduction of the world to a mechanism, with nature but an obstacle to overcome, a resource to be exploited, has in good measure determined the manner in which our cultural tradition has interacted with the living planet. Now to bring this home, when I was a young man, I was raised on the coast of British Columbia to believe that our forests existed to be cut. That was the essence of the ideology of scientific forestry that I studied in school and practiced in the woods as a logger. Now this cultural perspective was profoundly different from that of the First Nations. I was sent into a forest to cut it down. A Kwakwaka youth during his Hamatsa initiation would have been sent into the forest to confront Ukuk and the crooked beak of heaven, all with the goal of returning triumphant civilized to the potlatch such that the individual spiritual discipline and fortitude might revitalize the people with the energy of the wild. Now the point isn't to say who's right and who's wrong. Is that forest near cellulose and board feet? Is it the domain of the spirit? Those aren't the important questions. What matters is the potency of the belief and the manner in which conviction plays out in the day-to-day -day lives of a culture and therefore the impact that culture has on its environment. A child raised to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined 
will have a profoundly different relationship to that landscape than an Indian child raised to believe that that mountain is a deity that will direct his or her destiny for all time. The full measure of a culture embraces both the actions of a people and the quality of their aspirations, the character and the nature of the metaphors that propel them forward. And that's where we can find the essence of the relationship between indigenous people and the natural world. Life in the malaria swamps of New Guinea, in the cold of the Arctic, in the winds of Tibet, leave little room for sentiment. Nostalgia is not an emotion generally associated with the Inuit. Nomadic hunters in Borneo have notion, no notion of stewardship. In mountain forests, they lack the technology to even impact, let alone destroy. But what these cultures have done through time is to forge a kind of traditional mystique of the earth that is based not on some self-conscious notion of attachment to the land, but on a far more subtle intuition. And that is the idea that the land itself is breathed into being by human consciousness. Mountains, rivers, and forests are not perceived as being inanimate, as mere props upon a stage on which the human drama unfolds. For all of these societies, in my experience, the land is seen as being alive, a dynamic force to be embraced and transformed in the human imagination. Now, when we come back to our way of thinking, despite years of growing environmental concern, we still view the natural world essentially as a commodity, a raw resource to be consumed at our whims. When a mine is proposed, we accept it as normal that people who have never been on the land, who have no history or connection to the country, may legally secure the right to come in and by the very nature of their enterprises, leave in their wake a cultural and physical landscape utterly transformed and desecrated. What's more, in granting such mining concessions, often for trivial sums, we place no cultural or market value on the land itself. The cost of destroying a natural asset or its inherent worth, if left alone, has no metric in our economic calculations that support the industrialization of the wild. No company has to compensate the public for what it does to the commons, the forests, the mountains, the rivers, which by definition belong to everyone. All, as long as a company pr provides a promise of revenue and employment, it just needs permission from the government to proceed. Now we take that as a given because it's the foundation of our economic system, the way commerce extracts value and profit in a resource-driven economy. But if you think about it from the perspective of most cultures in the world, touched and inspired by very different visions of life and land, it appears to be a very odd and in fact highly anomalous set of beliefs and, and human behaviors. Critically, imbuing the natural world lakes, rivers, forests, the seas, with a sense of the sacred, is not contrary to science, but rather an acknowledgement of the complexity and wonder of ecological and biological systems that science alone has illuminated. And throughout the world, indigenous people, for example, who played no role whatsoever in the creation of the climate crisis, are seeing its impact in their lives, and it's very poignant to travel as I do and see that throughout the world, indigenous peoples, in terms of reference of their own belief systems, are doing far more to address the challenge than we, who caused it in the first place, are beginning to do. It's a seriousness of intent that can put many of us to shame. You know, we see climate change as public policy, economic opportunities, for some an economic debate, a, 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 a scientific debate, but it's important to realize that most indigenous cultures of the world think that they are personally responsible through their rituals and, and, and beliefs for the well-being of the natural world. So for them, climate change has become a deep psychological challenge, an existential dilemma, a moral crisis, because if the Earth suffers, it's their fault. In the Peruvian Andes, for example, glaciers are receding at such a rate that pilgrims believing the mountain gods to be angry are no longer carrying the ice from the heights back to their communities, foregoing the very gesture of reciprocity that completes the sacred cycle of the pilgrimage that has been known to exist in Peru for 3,000 years, a movement of ice back to the communities that allows everyone to benefit from the grace of the divine. In the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia, the mammals observe each season the recession 
the snow and ice that they see to be the literal heart of the world. They note the disappearance of birds, amphibians, the changing ecological character, the Potomos. They've increased both their ritual activities and they've vocally called on the younger brothers, as they deem us to be, to stop destroying the world. In the Trobian Islands, these small community on Boruluna will be utterly destroyed should sea levels rise, but even by a couple of feet. Among the Dogon in Mali, the Buddhists in Tibet, the Polynesian wayfinders, everywhere indigenous people are witnessing unprecedented changes in their environments, and they are everywhere reacting and taking action. An increase in ritual activities has been chronicled and often at great cost to the society among societies all around the world. The Balasana the Makuna in the Northwest Amazon, Aboriginal groups in Australia, amongst the shamanic cultures of Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. In Tanzania, the Maasai look up to a mountain, Kilimanjaro, that has lost 80% of its snow cap in a generation, and they ask what will become of the very idea of Africa when Kilimanjaro no longer shines over the ancient continent. Some years ago, I traveled from the Gluluk in the Canadian Arctic, 3,000 kilometers to northern Greenland with an Inuk friend who had once made the journey on foot with his dogs. Almost immediately as our chartered plane crossed over Baffin Island in the Canyon Basin, I could see from Theo's expression that something was wrong. It was March, and our flight took us 12 degrees south of the North Pole. The sea ice was simply not there. Smith Sound, which Theo had crossed with his dogs, was open water. He stared out the window in disbelief. And when we reached Kanak, the northernmost inhabited place on Earth in northwest Greenland, we found open leads in the ice, and we were obliged to hunt by boat. The ice in Kanak used to form in August and stay till in um, July. Now it comes in November and is gone by March. In the dialect of the polar Eskimo, the word sila means both weather and consciousness. Weather is life. And one afternoon as we stood on a headland looking for game, an elder said very simply to me, this is not our weather. Where does it come from? Well, the voices of indigenous people at this point in history really do matter because they can still be heard to remind us that there are indeed alternatives, other ways of orienting human beings in social, spiritual, and ecological space. This is not to suggest naively that we abandon anything in an attempt to mimic the ways of non-industrial societies, or that any culture should be asked to forfeit its right to benefit from the genius of technology. It is rather to draw inspiration and comfort from the fact that the path that we have taken is not the only one available, and that our destiny, therefore, is not indelibly written in a set of choices and beliefs that demonstrably and scientifically have proven not to be wise. By their very existence, the diverse cultures of the world bear witness to the folly of those who say, we cannot change, as we all know we must change, the fundamental manner in which we inhabit the planet. And this is why anthropology is the antidote to Trump because it maintains that the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. Its fundamental idea is that every culture has something to say, each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. Thanks very much. Nothing can be further from truth. Culture is not about the songs you sing, the prayers you utter, 
quoting you where culture is fundamentally about a body of ethical and moral values that every culture places around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within all human beings. It is culture alone that allows us to make sense out of sensation, find order and meaning in the universe that we have none, and to do as Lincoln said, always seek the better angels of a nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, when individuals, through pressure, coercion, or volition, turn their backs on the constraints and wisdom of tradition, often aspiring to a level of affluence that will always remain elusive, securing too often a place only on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere. And they find themselves in a sea of disaffection and alienation. If you want to know what happens, you have to simply look at the points of conflict around the world. Every conflict on Earth fundamentally comes down to an issue of culture. That's why anthropology, more than any other discipline, deserves to be at the foundation of the school of public policy, particularly in a world that still takes Western exceptionalism as a given, when in fact it is an utter and total lie. in the front row of my anthro. I, I teach, uh, when I came as a professor at UBC, I, put, I never had a job in my life. Um, so I didn't know much about it. And I only put one condition on the dean. I insisted that I'd be allowed to teach freshmen. And I teach anthro 100. And fortunately, even beloved Michael Blake, the head of the department, has no idea what I actually do in that class. <laughs> <laughs> anthro always says, teach culture any way you want. And he didn't know what he was at getting. Um, but now I've infected over, in four years, over 1,300 students who are right now on the UBC campus still. Uh, so these ideas are going to spread with this incredible cadre of graduate students like uh, Ashley and the amazing programs that are going to be just exploding out of this building. So this way, it's going to be really terrific. Go ahead. Can I stand up? Yeah, sure. Um, so you talked about there's no economic metric for um, for cultural values and maintaining indigenous traditions and all this. And it makes it very, very difficult to have a have a, a nuanced dialogue with someone who's constantly book, looking at economic growth of development of job creation. Um, how do you recommend uh, finding a way to communicate with someone who are in the center well, the, the, of the, the first thing I can do is deconstruct what they're saying. You know, um, uh, I, I, I firmly believe that, that um, being indigenous does not imply the right to be poor. Uh, 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 and I think it's also equally abhorrent that indigenous people, particularly in British Columbia, are, are constantly given the choice between poverty and industrial projects that compromise what they love most, their land. That's a choice no human being in any culture should ever face. But if you ask me what is the actual biggest threat to culture, it's not industry, it's ideology. And if the Marxist mania of Beijing vis-a-vis -vis ethnic groups in China is self-evident, the cult of the modern is less obvious to people. And too often, what we call development is just an excuse to get people off the land upon which they live forever, uh, and, and, who's, and, and, and a presence in the land proves inconvenient to nation states or to industrial interests. And that's something we see all over the place. So it's not a question of mines or no mines, economic activity or no economic activity. In terms of mines, it's how many mines, in, uh, uh, how many mines, at what cost the environment, and critic where and for whose benefit. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um, uh, when I met with Premier Campbell, um, it was to lobby him about the sacred headwaters. And, but I, I had very strategically published an article in National Geographic magazine in 2003, almost a decade before, on the Stikine, on the Stikine as a pure place of wonder. I, there was no politics, no environmentalism in that article. Because I wanted one day to be able to show that article to Canadian politicians and say the world knows about this place. And that's what I did. And in that photograph is an incredible 
uh, in that article is an incredible photograph of, actually, I showed it with Oscar with a 3030 across his lap. Right? Uh, and I had permission from the family to say this. I said, Mr. Premier, let me tell you about Oscar's family. In the last eight years, I had a One brother hung himself in the basement of his mother's house. Another brother drowned 15 feet from shore because they never learned to swim. A third brother died of medical malpractice in Prince Rupert. A sister got an ICD settlement and died in the streets of Prince George. And Oscar's only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette with a handgun in Terrace. That later turned out to be a drug hit from a disgruntled associate of Oscar's ex-wife. And I said, Mr. Premier, in the last the same eight years, Barrett Gold at Eskate Creek, environmentally and exemplary underground mine, has taken 400 tons of gold and 5,000 tons of silver at a, at a conservative value of $28 billion out of land that by any definition of Canadian law remains unceded, untreated territory, the land of the Taltan First Nation. And I said, Mr. Premier, I'd like to know why the infrastructure in the town of Iskut has not changed one iota in those eight years. Why isn't there, Mr. Premier, a swimming pool so kids can learn to swim? Why isn't there a hockey rink so kids have something to do in the winter? Why isn't there an elder center? Why aren't there funds set aside for low-interest loans for businesses to start that won't violate their landscape? Why aren't there scholarship funds in place paid for by that mine, if necessary, so that every kid in Iskid can get the certain guarantee of going to college that my kids got by growing up in urban Canada? And the Premier had no answer for that, save that he said, we cannot build things if they don't know how to maintain it. And the point is, that is the heart of the question. It's not about economic activity or no economic activity. It's economic activity for whose benefit and what cost to the environment, right? And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so the, the whole economic uh, argument very often becomes a bit of a ruse. It's the same thing with education. You know, I mean, everybody, education is one element of the development paradigm that is never questioned, right? Uh, I mean, how many of you had to read that book, Three Cups of Tea? Does anyone know about that book? It's really interesting because Canadians don't know this book, but this was a book that burst on the scene in the United States. It was so successful that the military gave a free copy of it to every soldier sent to Afghanistan. School children in kindergarten started a program called Pennies for Peace, which raised over $100 million for this man's foundation, which was said to be dedicated to building schools for young women in Afghanistan. Now, as it turns out, the whole thing unraveled. He was using the foundation as a personal ATM. I had read one page of the book and knew it was bullshit. And, and uh, he was spending more money buying his book on retail on Amazon.com to keep it at number one than he was building schools in uh, Afghanistan. The only reason he built a school in Afghanistan is because the book had done so well that his publishers wanted the second book and he had to have something for the book to talk about. And so he built a school that no one ever used. And yet what was it about that book that made it so popular? Millions and millions of copies sold because it reinforced America's faith in the inherent simplicity of the world. If only we get Muslim girls into school, all the problems of that part of the world will disappear. And that's why the army gave a copy to every soldier. And that is a blind faith we have in education. But education, at the same time, we've had this reconciliation process where we severely condemn what we did with the residential schools. But the pedagogies of schools all around the world are no different than what we did with indigenous people here. And don't forget, the residential schools weren't set up by the bad people in our society. The bad people just wanted to kill the Indians. They were set up by the good, well-intentioned liberals who just saw this as the best thing we could do for those people, right? But the pedagogies, taking people away from their families, forbidding them from speaking their own language, socializing them into a cadre of another world order, is exactly what the school systems do all around the world. And it is never criticized. Northern Kenya, 
as a way to mitigate drug. You try to get your foot in the cash economy by sending an eldest son to school, fine. But they go to a school led by the state or by missionaries where pastoral nomads are embarrassment. So the kid comes into school as a nomad, a scion of a rich tradition that goes back for generations. He learns a modicum of literacy, but in the context it teaches him to be contemptuous of his family. So he comes into school as a nomad, he graduates as a clerk, he can't go back, because he's not as who he is. So he goes forward, what does that mean? To go to Nairobi and try to scratch a living from the edges of a cash economy that has a 50% unemployment rate for high school graduates. By all the indices of the development paradigm, everything's gone up. Urbanization, per capita income, literacy rates, but quality of life has plummeted. And this is something we see around the world. That doesn't mean education is bad, it's essential but it has to be delivered in a, culture, a context that's respectful to the culture and the value of that culture. We made a film called Schooling the World and we marched into a classroom in Ladakh and this poor woman who didn't speak English was forced to teach in English a biology, a botany lesson, and she was talking about xerophytic plants. Xerophytic just means plants that grow in dry habitats, but she didn't know that. The kids didn't know that. So this is how it went, xerophytic plants. Plants grow bad places. Ladakh, lots of xerophytic plants. Ladakh, bad place. And the kids were writing this down. There was a picture window that looked out over one of the richest dryland forests in the Himalaya. And every one of those kids' grandparents knows every single species in that forest, right? But what was the fundamental message of that classroom experience? And this happens all the time. And that's why it's so essential that education within a cultural context that lifts up the wonder of the culture as opposed to putting it down. Anyway, not that. <laughs> uh, anyway, any other questions? Yes? You mentioned the Well, I mean, when I say when I say that, because I mean the, the bear, I mean, you know, I, you know, I mean, there's some wonderful miners. And Ross Beatty, who's a dear friend of mine, neighbor on Bowen Island, the Beatty Biodiversity Center, is a wild geologist. And he's been extremely successful uh, as an owner of mines all around the world. So uh, but, but, but the thing is, in the case of the um, the, 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 the Barrett mine at S.K. Creek was an underground mine, and I'm no, believe me, I'm no expert or authority on, on, on mining engineering, but I've never heard uh, in 30 years of operating anyone questioning anything in terms of the uh, environmental impact of that mine. And all I'm saying is that from Scuttlebutt, it was about as good a mine. I'm sure there were some problems and some, some extreme environmentalists might be able to say that, but fundamentally, you know, it was, no, that wasn't an issue. Whereas in the case of the Red Chris mine, again, one of the problems in all of this, to be sympathetic to the mining industry, if you think about it, that it's really hard to get a mine going. It takes a huge amount of capital for what is inherently a speculative venture. And just when, and, and it's incredibly expensive to go through the assessment process, compromises that process may in fact be, but the problem is that when the mining companies desperately need to be cash rich, when they actually start building the mine, is when by definition they're cash poor, Because they've exhausted all their venture capital often, and they haven't begun to generate a revenue flow. So if they don't have other assets and other mines, it could be really problematic. What we should be doing, if we're going to subsidize the mining industry, in my opinion, and this is going to fly politically, is that if you want to subsidize a mining company, for God's sake, subsidize them when they're starting to build the mine. In other words, if we decide as a society that a mine can go here, and that's a collective decision we make as a people, then it behooves us to do everything possible to assist that mining company building, and both in terms of bonds for the shutdown of the mine, financing those bonds, but also making sure that the mine, that we're not cutting corners just because the mine is undercapitalized. And so in the case of the Red Chris mine, there are other alternatives to wet tail and storage, but they're more expensive. So of course the mine's interest is to keep costs as low as possible. So I don't think we should ever 
be allowing you know, cost concerns alone to compromise the installation of these projects that we live with for not just a 30 or 40 year lifetime of the mine, but literally we inherit this, these places indefinitely. Because, I mean, you have to manage the acid drainage problem basically indefinitely. So that, to me, that's the thing we should be building the very best mines we can. And the whole setup is such that it almost mitigates against being able to do that. Yes, uh, what incentivized uh, Hunt Oil to not compromise to uh, be more ethically responsible or environmentally conscious? Well, I, I tell you, it's a funny story. I, I, I had never heard of Hunt Oil. And I gave a lecture at SMU, a famous and valid lecture. And I got a call at 11 o'clock at night from the uh, head of the president of SMU saying one of their big supporters had heard my talk and wanted to meet me for breakfast. And she said, sure, I'm happy to do that. I went to meet this short little Texas guy. I had no idea who he was, no idea who Hunt Oil was. And his first words to me were, uh, Knight talked all about shamanism, voodoo, and hallucinogenic plants, and proving the sacred jar. You know? Anyway, he was in the audience, because he, he personally puts 50 students for SMU every year. Do the math on that, $60,000 by 50 every year, just quietly support young scholarship kids. Pretty amazing. Anyway, so his first words to me were, like, I, I didn't understand everything you had to say last night. But I have a little bitty project in Peru, and my name's in this company, my son's name's in this company, and we want to do it right. And I think you can help us do it right. <laughs> I was so taken by that that I got back to D.C. and I called up my friend Tom Lovejoy, who may know invented the term biodiversity, the most respected forest ecologist in the world, for almost head of the Smithsonian. I said, Tom, you've got to come in on this with me, because they needed an independent panel to get the money from the multilateral banks. So the panel became Tom Lovejoy, myself, and Malcolm Gillis, the president of Rice University. And a year and a half later, we were at a meeting where hundreds of people were showing us everything about everything. And Tom just leaned over to me and said, thank you for getting me into this. They, they did it for one simple reason. They wanted to do it right. And they, they, uh, there was one time where we went down, their, their, um, their oil, uh, their extracted platforms in the, in the forest were little islands. They did everything by air. And their platforms were so clean, you could eat breakfast off them. And we flew at eye, a canopy level, challenging Tom, who is the world authority in tropical reforest, tropical forest regeneration, to identify from the air where the pipelines had been buried. He couldn't find them. You know, and, and uh, I mean, you, you just can't imagine. But you know, on the other hand, it was a project upon which their, their company was going to be measured. Camasilla had been a disaster, um, the first phase of Camasilla, and they wanted to do it right. And I, you know, I was really proud to have been part of that.